This is the first time I'm presenting this at a tech conference. So I hope that uh, the material will engage you. This talk is about post-growth entrepreneurship. I presume that uh, the majority of you have not heard that term yet, which is good. Uh, it provides me with a green field on which I can explain. It's useful uh, first to tell you a little bit about myself. So my name is Melanie Ryback, and I am the CEO and co-founder of a not-for-profit computer security consultancy company. Not-for-profit. Sounds a bit strange, uh, and it is. <laughs> I started Radically Open Security about five years ago. Um, we are a social enterprise, uh, which in the computer security space is quite rare. Uh, but I've been trying to take it a bit further than just being a social enterprise. In the last five years of running a not-for-profit computer security consultancy company, and I will explain soon what I mean by not-for-profit, um, I've learned a whole lot of lessons, and really I see this talk as being a bit of a distillation of some of the lessons that I've learned, combined with, uh, well, some background, which I think goes along very much with the spirit of today. So, I'm actually going to start by talking about economics. Yeah, odd topic for an IT conference. But there's this new generation of economists that are called post-growth economists. And particularly, I ran into one economist that very much spoke to me, and her name is Kate Rayworth. She wrote an excellent book called Donut Economics. She talks about um, growth, specifically. And of course, being a macroeconomist, macro she looks a lot at growth on a national level with concepts such as gross domestic product, GDP. So she asks questions along the lines of, you know, with GDP, we're used to always seeing it be up and to the right. The moment that the national economy, that the GDP starts flattening out, the country gets into a recession, and then people typically get laid off, they suffer. The question is, why? So her explanation is because there is an extractive element from our economy. The extraction sometimes comes in the form of a dividend from stocks, you know, shares of companies. Sometimes the extraction comes from the forms of uh, exits. People selling their company, you know, mergers, acquisitions, IPOs. Of course, you know, as IT people, <laughs> we play a role <laughs> in some of this as well, which is precisely why I'm here uh, to give this talk. But what Kate says is, you know, th this growth, you know, even if you try to make a durable growth, green growth, sustainable growth, it's still growth. And the problem with growth is it puts a lot of pressure on our ecosystems. So socially, but also environmentally. And there is actually nothing, there, there are no externalities from an economic system. Actually, everything is just input into that same system. Now, she looks at biology, and she draws a lot of very useful metaphors from biology. So for example, if you take a look at a child, or a tree, or a dog, at the very beginning of their lives, they grow really, really quickly, maybe even exponentially. But at a certain point, that growth starts leveling off, and at a certain point, it reaches its maximum size, and it stops growing, and it starts thriving. If you have, say, a tree, and then the tree wants to continue growing after it reaches its maximum size, the next thing it does is it drops seeds. And those seeds spread, and they become little trees. And then those little trees grow and then reach their flatten out and reach their maximum size, etc. Now, the question that I want to ask is, why is it different with our businesses? There are a few exceptions in nature of things that grow exponentially, one of which is often malignant and might kill you. 
But I'm not just talking about cancer. <laughs> There's even, I, I heard another example from someone that there was a kind of deer, apparently, that had horns that grew forever. And apparently, eventually, those horns wound up snapping the neck of the deer. So nature is about flat growth curves. But there's this alternative that all of us tend to get really hung up on, <laughs> and it's called Silicon Valley. <laughs> all of us in IT, we love Silicon Valley. And it doesn't matter where in the world we live, we all want to be the Silicon Valley of fill in the blank. <laughs> right? And typically, the Silicon Valley model, which we see everywhere, looks like the following. You've got the exponential curve, of course, you know, the hockey stick, <laughs> you know, which we find, you know, in every single MBA program, every single startup incubator, every single pitch deck, <laughs> you know, it, it's hard to get away from these. So it starts with a big pot of money, right? <laughs> you need some kind of an investment at the beginning. So it could be venture capital, it could be subsidy, it could be crowdfunding. It doesn't matter. You're starting out with this big pot of money. Then you have the exponential growth, AKA scaling, because we all want to know, know how we can build things that scale. And then at a certain point, we hit this critical mass, and then we exit, yeah? And then when we exit, you know, then at that point, we have won the game of entrepreneurship. You know, we can go and retire on some island, and then we can eventually get bored and then rinse and repeat. This is the Silicon Valley dream. Now the question is really, who benefits from this? Now, I believe, and I, this is just my own personal feeling, but I believe that, for example, starting out with the big pot of money, of course, this is a very convenient way of allowing those who already have money, such as venture capitalists, but also large companies, of allowing them to get into our startups early. That comes with a certain measure of control. I personally believe that both venture capital and external investment and exits are actually in service of maintaining the status quo. Because the next generation of entrepreneurs, we can be unruly. We can build things that you know, can change things disruptively, <laughs> that, can, that can unseat the incumbents. Isn't it really convenient if they can control us early? And if they don't get us at the beginning, they can get us at the end. <laughs> what about the whole exponential growth thing? I would say that exponential growth, perhaps, is really just in service of the exit. Because truthfully, if you're not planning on exiting, exponential growth doesn't matter. Slow, organic, linear growth, even flat growth, is fine. It'll get you there. But it requires a different way of thinking. Which leads us to our education system. I'm going to come back very quickly to economics. Occupy Wall Street organized a walkout of the introduct Introduction to Economics Lecture, EC10, at Harvard University. The students in the front row stood up and they said, we don't want the ideology that you are teaching in this class. And they walked out. Now my question is, why are there no walkouts from our business schools? Because our business education shares exactly the same problem. So what exactly is this ideology that's embedded in what we're getting in our business education? I think it starts with really fundamental things. Even things that are so simple, like definitions of certain words. Take the word profit. Now, we all think that we know what profit means, right? I want my business to be profitable, <laughs> you know? Of course I need to make profit, otherwise my company will fall over. <laughs> These things all sound really reasonable, but the problem is that the word profit actually has a double meaning. 
and many of us do not realize this. The first meaning of the word profit is what I call margin on turnover. So essentially, if you have a business and you are selling something to somebody, that is turnover, right? <laughs> um, if you do not have turnover, then by definition, you are not a business. <laughs> Maybe you have a hobby, but you are probably not a business. Margin, essentially, is that small uh, amount of extra money that you would charge on what it is that you're selling that you can then reinvest into the business to actually build a stable vehicle. I would also say that I believe that this is essential also for running a solid business. You know, if you don't reinvest anything, again, the vehicle will fall over. This is true. But the problem is there's also a second meaning of the word profit, and that's dividend. That is essentially the value that is extracted from our businesses. And again, usually in the form of things like stock, <laughs> you know, but it could also take the form of exits. Now, but the problem is these two completely different concepts are combined into the same word. You know, so when people say, you know, well, of course my business needs to be profitable, <laughs> otherwise we'll fall over, what, you know, which piece of the word profit, which part of the definition of the word profit are you talking about? If you're talking about the margin on turnover, I would totally agree with you. But if you are talking about the dividend, I, not only do I completely disagree, but I think it's harmful. <laughs> But we don't realize this. And to me, I mean, when I realized this, you know, in a way, w this is the system, right? <laughs> you know, we like to complain about the system. <laughs> but I believe with things like this, it's very subtle, but I believe it's staring the system right in the face. <laughs> in that same word, we cannot even separate out that extractive element <laughs> that's causing so many problems from the actual m margin on turnover we need to keep the business running. What t for me, when I realized this, I felt like I s took a step back and saw the matrix for the first time. <laughs> you know? And then you're left with the question of, you know, can you go back to business as usual? You know? Do you take the red pill or do you take the blue pill? But there's more. There's a lot of other business concepts uh, that also have some inherent problems. Another business concept that we all think we very well understand are things like network effects and economies of scale. So, um, you know, we can take, for example, social media, <laughs> uh, you know, Facebook, and for example, uh, Facebook clones. You know, and there's a common perception that the only way to overcome network effects and or to gain economy of scale is essentially by starting with that big pot of, uh, pot of money, <laughs> having exponential growth, and then hoping that you reach that critical mass that you can then benefit from the network effects and benefit from the economies of scale before your runway runs out. You know, we, we commonly think this is the way to do it. And there are so many platforms, you know, including, you know, if you think you want to de dethrone Facebook, you know, we're, we're, we're all going to try it that way. And if you look at in the past, other kinds of Facebook clones, Facebook competitors, whether we're talking diaspora or Mastodon now, I mean, it's always the same thing. It starts with subsidy, or it starts with crowdfunding, or maybe it starts with external investment. It makes this really big run for it, you know? <laughs> but then at the, at the end, it doesn't quite make it, you know? <laughs> and it doesn't have that, you know, the network effects, and then eventually just the whole thing falls over. But I think that's actually really logical. I think this style of thinking is actually part of the reason why 80% of startups fail. <laughs> because it turns out that it's actually really difficult to grow a business this way. I would like to liken it to, for example, throwing a dart at a dartboard. You know, if I want to throw a dart at a dartboard, I can do one of two things. Either I can stand all the way across the room and take a really big throw with the dart. And if I have a good eye, and I'm good at darts, and I'm a little bit lucky, <laughs> I might hit that dartboard right in the middle in the target. Or I might not, you know, because playing darts is kind of hard. The other way that I can do it 
is I can take the dart and I can walk slowly across the room <laughs> to the dartboard and then place the dart in the middle of the target. Hey, that's making my life easier. Now, I would like to say that that is the difference between the Silicon Valley model with, with venture capital versus bootstrapping. Okay? And for those of you who don't know what bootstrapping means, it essentially means starting with nothing. Everybody thinks, yeah, but starting with nothing, how is that going to make you go any faster? <laughs> well, actually, it turns out that there's a number of reasons why it's actually considerably smarter to start with nothing. When I first started Radically Open Security five years ago, I was offered a half a million euros by an angel investor friend of mine. Very good friend of mine, nice guy. <laughs> I turned him down. Why? <laughs> I mean. Partly because, well, mostly because I did not want to lose this much control over my company. <laughs> but it actually turned out that that was the smartest decision that I made. Because when I turned him down and I didn't have that big pot of money, it meant that I had to bootstrap my company out of my savings account. You know, and granted, I'm an IT person and I've worked at Citrix and ING Bank and a few places, so I had some money saved up, but I'm not rich, <laughs> so you know, it, it only gets you so far. But what that meant is it really influenced the decisions that I made. <laughs> For example, uh, in year one, I was not able to pay myself a salary. Yeah, logical, there was no money. <laughs> you know, it also meant I wasn't able to pay anybody else an internal salary. So instead, I decided that I was going to work with freelancers. That turned out to be one of the smartest decisions I ever made. And I created Radically Open Security as a platform organization. You know, We're all familiar with platforms, the way that uh, Uber is a taxi company without vehicles, or Airbnb is a hotel company without property. Radically Open Security is a penetration testing company without any personnel. <laughs> Five years later, I have 40 staff members, and there is still only one internal employee, <laughs> me. And I say, you know, I come from Miami, we say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> but it turns out that it was a super flexible and scalable way of doing it, not just in scaling down, but also in scaling up. And that's how, in five years' time, I managed to create a security company that has 40 people, 80 customers, and yes, we are a preferred vendor now for Google. <laughs> and Mozilla, <laughs> and the Dutch government, and law enforcement, and banks, and insurance companies, and hosting providers, telcos, TV stations, lawyers, you know, uh, SMEs, also startups for cheaper, and also nonprofits, NGOs, and civil society groups for whom we work on a nonprofit basis at cost price. So, uh, it turns out that when you have nothing, it forces you to be creative. Because <laughs> when you start with a lot, it actually makes you lazy. You know, it makes you want to start by getting a salary on year one. It makes you want to start with this fancy office, <laughs> you know, and with uh, comfy desk chairs, you know, because we all like comfy desk chairs. But the problem with this is you start in the red. And as soon as you start in the red, the clock starts ticking. And that's when you start having this runway. If you s but when you start with nothing, it forces you to have a laser focus on your value proposition, which forces you from day one to get a business model straight that works from the smallest possible <laughs> level. And, and it really starts with a concept that I like to call minimum viable platforms. If you're setting up as a platform, can you start with just one producer of whatever it is you're doing, one consumer of whatever it is you're doing, and then the platform? And as long as the consumer is paying for the work that the producer is doing, <laughs> then you already have some turnover. And turnover is the most powerful financing that exists. Also because it keeps coming back again and again. See, a runway you can only use once. But customers are like, they c if th the money from customers compounds, like interest in the bank account. We don't think about this. <laughs> And I believe, I would love to see a data scientist do an actual study 
on whether or not venture capital is an accelerator for service-based startups. We all assume that it is. Are we sure? Has anyone actually tested this? I'd like to see the data. So another nice thing is that all of this enables us to remain free of influences that would steer our company in the wrong direction. And the really nice thing is, when we're not being steered, it means we can be social. And when we're being social, it means we can get a lot of things done. We think a lot of times about social entrepreneurship, right? And the nice thing about social entrepreneurship is that you don't need subsidies and donations to be able to make a positive impact in the world. A lot of people think that if they want to, you know, to, to run, for example, NGOs or you know, uh, just not-for-profit organizations, the problem is, and especially in today's political climate, subsidies and donations are drying up. Yeah. Which means that we need other cash streams. But the problem is, of course, a lot of, uh, and this is a problem actually that both uh, NGOs and um, artists actually, <laughs> uh, and also academics share, is we fall into something called the subsidy trap. Now I can tell you because I'm a former assistant professor of computer science myself <laughs> uh, from the Free, Free University of Amsterdam. But the problem with subsidy is that, again, it's this big pot of money. And from the moment, it's this runway, and, and you're operating in the red. And you keep being dependent on whoever it is that's funding you, because the moment they stop funding you, the thing falls over. The other thing also is you are not getting direct feedback from the market <laughs> that what you are doing is actually providing any value, because where the money is coming from is actually a different place than those that you're serving. <laughs> you know, and this sometimes makes NGOs uh, ineffective. This also sometimes causes academics to create research projects that fall over the money, uh, you know, the, the moment the uh, subsidy uh, is, uh, is finished. You know, if we're really trying to go for durable change, <laughs> I don't necessarily think that this is you know, the, the most effective way of doing it. And also for creative artists, you know, they're, they're addicted to subsidy sometimes too. But the problem is the system sometimes of subsidies penalizes those who want to be entrepreneurial. So there's some artists out there who are kind of struggling and, and they might be getting some subsidy and they would be like, yeah, I would love you know, to uh, uh, create a business on the side, but if I do, I'm gonna lose my subsidy. It's the same thing as the poverty trap that poor people are stuck in. You know, if you're poor and you have nothing and you basically are, are on welfare, the moment you want to start a business to pull yourself out of poverty, <laughs> you know, you lose the welfare. Well, we've got exactly the same problem, <laughs> you know, hampering our activists, our academics, and our artists. But nobody is making any noise about this. But that's odd because we keep thinking, well, but these people should be weaning themselves off of the subsidy, shouldn't they? But the system is actually fighting against them. But, you know, there's small pots of money, which are things like uh, subsidies and donations, but there's much, much, much bigger pots of money we can use for social good in, in procurement. <laughs> if you think about the amount of money that governments spend on procuring from vendors that is so enormous <laughs> that sub any amount of subsidies you know, and donations are a drop in the bucket <laughs> you know, next to what they procure. This is the reason why we have so many big accountancy firms in the big fancy rich part of town with these huge buildings. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, you know, to be fair, that's where all that money is going. <laughs> but what if, what if actually this money went to social things instead? That would be powerful. In fact, that would be disruptive. So how do we make this happen? I mean, I think it requires some attention on a few topics, one of which is social procurement. We don't need subsidies. And again, it's that big pot of money that actually doesn't help us make smart decisions. Why not instead you know, build social enterprises in that space and promote social procurement policies so that companies 
and governments want to procure from us. <laughs> you know? This is something actually that these are changes that can be made within a company that cost nothing. <laughs> I mean, it might go against the culture <laughs> in some more conservative places, but it actually costs nothing to put a more social procurement policy in place. Why aren't we all doing this? Another thing we need to think about is the topic of social compliance. We're all familiar, of course, with compliance, <laughs> and that drives a whole lot of procurement budgets as well. But the problem with compliance is that it's very fear-driven. You know? it, it's a whole lot of checkbox ticking. And, and trust me, I work in security, I know. <laughs> and uh, you know, a lot of trying to meet minimum standards because people are afraid of getting uh, fined. You know? And it's the usual conservative attitudes of, you know, I, well, nobody ever got fired from, for purchasing from, you know, insert name of multinational here. <laughs> you know, it's that line of thinking. But what if we started creating a dialogue about how we can look at compliance, both in terms of the regulations themselves, but maybe even more importantly, in terms of how we are interpreting those regulations? It turns out it's actually a cultural thing that we need to change. <laughs> You know, I mean, we probably can't change the regulations quickly, but we can attempt to change that culture of fear and to put something more social in its place instead. Why aren't we doing this? Maybe we can. Which brings us again to the topic of social enterprise. Now, the uh, man in this, uh, in this slide might look familiar to some of you. His name is Mohammed Yunus. And you know, oftentimes when we speak about uh, social enterprise, his name comes up quite frequently. He is a Nobel Prize winner who invented microfinance. And he created this organization called the Grumian Bank. So Mohammed Yunus, he is from Bangladesh, and essentially he gives these micro loans to women uh, in, well, starting in Bangladesh, but now of course it's uh, globally spread. Uh, he typically gives it to women because men apparently drink the money. But uh <laughs> He also wrote one of the first books on what you could call social entrepreneurship. He calls it social business, and he wrote this book called Building Social Business. Now, he defines social business as follows. No dividend business for solving human problems. No dividend business for solving human problems. So Silicon Valley loves Muhammad Yunus, and they jumped on his ideas, and they said, solving human problems, yes. No dividend? We didn't hear that. <laughs> that doesn't work for us. You know, th this part we're just sort of going to sweep under, uh, underneath the rug. And this is the reason why a social entrepreneurship ecosystem sprung up in which we have concepts such as impact investors and selling your B Corporation to Unilever. And then at a certain point, people start looking at social enterprises and saying, well, actually, I don't understand. What is the difference between a social enterprise and a normal company that's just a little less evil? <laughs> Or maybe a normal company that has corporate social responsibility. <laughs> yeah. What we need to understand is that social enterprise is actually a spectrum from the nonprofit end all the way to the commercial end. Now, I would say that the commercial end of the spectrum has been very well explored. However, the nonprofit end is a green field ripe for exploration. I personally find this exciting because it means that there's something we haven't tried yet and we're in a time where we need it. Another thing that social enterprise has kind of missed out on is, well, it, you know, it tends to be a very tiny niche. So, Sustainable development goals. Oftentimes, when we think about social enterprise, we think about the SDGs, right? And to be fair, they're important, 
You know, if you can create businesses that are focused on the SDGs, I say super, really laudable. That's great, you know? I mean, so businesses with, a, with the core topic of something in Africa or solar panels or clean drinking water or, you know, all of these things are great. But the problem is, though, that this is only 0.001% of businesses on the planet <laughs> that have anything at all to do with the SDGs. What about the other ones, you know? I like to call those other ones boring but necessary. <laughs> so, okay, they're not as sexy as the SDGs, I'll give you that, but, you know, they do just so happen to be running the world right now. <laughs> so the question is, how do we take that other 99.99% .99 of businesses and how do we make them social? See, if we can crack this nut, <laughs> I think we can make even more change. So how do you make the Chinese restaurant on the corner social? How do you make the plumber social? <laughs> yeah, the hairdresser, or maybe our software companies. I think perhaps that a hint could be located in the concept of post-growth business. I would like to defi define post-growth business as follows. One, no dividend. That's the extractive element. See, if we want to build a post-growth economy, we need to think about what is the economy, actually. <laughs> and I would say that, well, actually, an economy is a meta-concept <laughs> of the aggregate of, say, businesses, <laughs> but also government, academic institutions, individuals, <laughs> you know. But how can we build a post-growth economy if we don't know how to build post-growth businesses? If we want to cut that extractive element out of our economy, it has to, by, it, by definition, it has to start with our businesses. So this is why I would argue that post-growth businesses would need to run, first of all, without dividend, because that's the extraction right there. Second of all, with no exits. <laughs> And thirdly, uh, also without that corrupting influence plus the big pot of money approach from the investors. Now, these three things here, Silicon Valley types are going to look at this and they're going to say, well, this is completely useless. We can't do anything with this. Yeah, that's true. They can't. <laughs> but it might just so happen, though, that this is actually what we need if we want to fully decouple the profit motive from the actual op vehicle of having an operational business. So we can re-envision that as a pure vehicle for positive change. You know? What if, by decoupling the profit motive from the business, we can start re-envisioning what business means? What if I told you that business is one of the most effective forms of activism? Or what if I told you that business is one of the most beautiful, expressive forms of art? What if I told you that business is a vehicle for pure creative expression? Or perhaps that maybe business is a vehicle for spirituality? Now, you might think I'm a little bit crazy, maybe a little bit weird. We're not taught to think about business this way, but why not? Why not? So what can we do with this? Well, it turns out we could do a whole lot. You could create post-growth versions of almost everything. <laughs> so post-growth software company? Great. <laughs> we can do that. Post-growth carbon offsetting? That's an interesting one. <laughs> A lot of people think, yeah, but aren't the, these businesses are weird, you know, and, and the industry, you know, customers are used to commercial organizations. How are they going to trust you? How are they going to trust your motives? How are they going to take you seriously? You know, I got this question a lot when I first started Radically Open Security five years ago. I told people I was going to start a not-for-profit computer security consultancy company, and everybody said, what? You're on crack. <laughs> and who will trust you? Well, it turns out, actually, that a lot of people trusted us. And in fact, they trust us even more 
because they know that if we're not just doing it for the profit, <laughs> that it means that we actually have other motivations. <laughs> and those other motivations include optimally serving our customers, optimally serving our staff, and optimally serving society. Yeah, and who isn't going to want to get on board with that? <laughs> you know, it's like putting a fair trade alternative on the market, but then not for consumers, but business to business. You know? Because, of course, consumers, sometimes with fair trade, they have trouble, you know, purchasing things, you know, if it's slightly more expensive. Well, I, you know, for B2B, first of all, uh, well, uh, governments and, cus and, and businesses can afford a whole lot, <laughs> I can tell you. And as long as you're roughly conform with the market, <laughs> then they actually have no reason not to use you. <laughs> You know? And it's actually easier to spread your business this way than you would think. It's pure crossing the chasm style of thinking. You just start with the ethical niche, with the early adopters who actually care about making a difference in the world. You know? um, and it turns out, actually, that those people will fight to get you in the door. <laughs> and not only that, but it's actually also really good for recruiting. <laughs> you know? Uh, it, it turns out, actually, that ethics has market value. Who knew? <laughs> and ethics also has recruiting value. You know, I run a security company. I can tell you, hackers are super, super ethical. And most of them are really idealistic, because the hacker community is very much related to the open source community. <laughs> you know, and as you guys know, the open source community also is incredibly idealistic which means that it helps you to attract a lot of the best staff members. So the funny thing is, the early adopters will want to use you, <laughs> you know, because of your ideals, but it turns out you're going to attract such really, really good staff <laughs> that, you know, by that time, you, after you've served a number of early adopters, I mean, the quality you're going to be providing from these idealis idealistic people is going to be so high that that's going to make your reputation on the market, <laughs> and then everybody else is going to start following. See, this isn't just theory. I've, I'm living this. <laughs> I've built this. I've been doing this for the last five years. So, but the nice thing about being able to create all of these different kinds of post-growth companies is that what we're actually doing is we are redirecting cash streams. And this is where it starts to become really fundamentally scary to those in power. Because let's say I want to create a post-growth uh, accountancy firm, right? I could do that. <laughs> and, you know, that works in exactly the same area as, say, I don't know, the big four. <laughs> well, we know how much money is going through that ecosystem, right? <laughs> what if I could create a post-growth uh, accountancy firm and then... Essentially, I could uh, redirect the cash using the same staff, having them do the same things, and then essentially using the profit, basically the dividend from that, and rather than using it to build expensive buildings, we can then use it to fund, say, a universal basic income, in a, for example, a country like the Netherlands. Anyhow, I'm going to uh, round my story off uh, because I'm reaching the end of the time that I have. But I want you to think about how you can take your skills and use them to make an optimally positive effect on this world. Thank you. Sure. Was I five minutes over or five minutes uh, under? Okay. Yeah. No, that's fine. Are, are there any questions? I'd be happy to answer them. Yes. I really love this stuff. Yes. <laughs> First Thank of you. all. Second. Um, I mean, you say that no investors, no exits, and so on and so forth. So, but think of, for example, a startup. 
and hardware setup that needs, for example, to buy a lot of stuff at the beginning in order to build a product. Yes. And you said no money, no investors. How, how can you solve that problem? Because so I mean, for for consultancy company, when actually you can start very small, mm -hmm. and you can start offering and making slowly money. Okay, it yeah. can work somehow. But then for other kind of you know startups or cases, how can you manage that? So it's actually quite simple. You can use services to bootstrap products. That's exactly what Radically Open Security has done. So you start by selling consultancy or selling some service that uh, doesn't require a whole lot of investment. And as you perform that service over and over, then essentially that is going to give you turnover that you can then reinvest in things like uh, process or in things like IT infrastructure or tooling. And before you know it, you take a step back and then you realize that, holy crap, I just developed a whole bunch of intellectual property. I mean, of course, uh, for me personally, what I then do is I go and open source that. <laughs> in fact, I make it an OWASP project <laughs> you know, because that's what my, uh, what my company has done. But the fact is you can use services to bootstrap products. Another thing that I would have liked to have explained, but I ran out of time, <laughs> is that um, what you can do is you can actually crowdsource ethical supply chains from the bottom up. <laughs> uh, I didn't have enough time to really address products, but uh, let's say, for example, that you have a company like Fairphone. Okay? Sorry? Fairphone. So basically, uh, some phones, uh, well, mo a lot of electronics has uh, some uh, metals and, and minerals in there that uh, come from uh, conflict areas in Africa, for example, and they try to make, uh, f well, electronics without these particular uh, conflict uh, minerals and metals. So um, Fairphone is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Dutch company uh, that uh, attempted to do this with a cell phone. But the problem was that the CEO, this really awesome, heroic guy named Bas van Abel, he uh, started with, with a big pot of money, <laughs> so started with crowdfunding. Then he got some investment from uh, the local telecom company in the Netherlands. And then at that point, he was like, crap, now I have to build this. <laughs> So he went to Shenzhen, <laughs> and he looked around to find the least evil vendors, you know. And it turns out that, you know, cell phones are complex beasts. They have roughly 400 components, all of which have supply chains, and then those have supply chains, w w those supply chains have supply chains, have supply chains, etc. And it, he went back two years later and then realized that, crap, you know, even though I asked them really sweetly, could you please be fair, it turns out that actually 99% <laughs> percent of my fair phone actually still is not fair because I'm not the largest vendor with these uh, suppliers or I'm not the largest procurer with these su suppliers. It turns out actually that it's incredibly hard to build ethical supply chains from the top down. However, the key, the secret lies in the, f in the boring but necessary. So if we can create post growth, boring but necessary companies, what we can do is we can then atomically do something small really, really well. So say, you know, for, forget about a fair phone. Can I build a fair LED? Even that sounds pretty hard, right? I mean, what's an LED? I mean, metal, glass, a diode? Can I build a fair diode? <laughs> you know, let's say that some dude has an uncle who has a diode factory and he knows how to build them fair. Okay, you know, hypothetically. Let's say we've got now a fair diode. Let's say this diode is one out of the 400 components in a fair phone. Now, you still don't have a fair phone. However, you now have a fair diode, which you could use in every single cell phone manufacturer in the world, which means you still don't have a fair phone, but one 400th of every phone can be fair. That's how we do it. It's, it's reductionistic engineering thinking. Take a problem. Split it down into smaller problems. Can we solve that? No. Let's break it down into even smaller problems. I would wager to say that I think we can re-envision almost every technology problem that we have as a business model problem. <laughs> you know? Anyway, I think uh, I've run out of time for questions, but uh, I hope this has given you some food for th thought. So thank you very much. Thank you.